What if I told you that Stephen King isn't the only horror author? I know, shocking! If you ask for a suggestion of a horror novel to read, you're likely to be recommended something by Stephen King. And to be sure, he's written a lot of great stuff, but he's not the only horror author, of course. And there are many authors who deserve just as much attention and simply don't get as much attention as somebody like Stephen King or Clive Barker. In this video, I'm going to recommend five horror authors who deserve a larger audience than they have. And I hope this will be the first video in a series because these five are certainly not the only authors who deserve a lot more attention. They're just the ones that I've chosen for this particular video. And I should also say I'm presenting these in no particular order. These are not the only five authors I recommend. They are five of the authors I recommend. And the one I mentioned first is not my first recommendation. It's just the first one that I happen to discuss. The wonderful thing about horror, movies, and books is that the genre is so broad that there's really a little something for everyone. So I've chosen five authors that represent something of a cross-section of different styles and different approaches to the genre. All of that prefatory information out of the way, let's get right into it and meet five authors that you should be reading. The first author on my list is somebody that some of you might be familiar with because he also has a channel here on YouTube and that is Adam Caesar. And before somebody in the comments tries to correct me, I am not mispronouncing Cesare. He does pronounce it Caesar. In addition to having a fairly successful YouTube channel where he discusses horror books and horror movies, he has written many horror books of his own. I've chosen three that I'd like to highlight. And the first of those is this book, Video Night. This is a book that tells the story, roughly speaking, of what happens when monstrous aliens run up against a bunch of nerds gathered to watch their horror movies. The description on the back says, Billy and Tom are best friends, but each knows that by the end of the school year their lives will be moving in different directions. But why not have their friendship go out with a bang by throwing one last video night? They can invite some girls over, order a pizza, sneak some beer, then maybe try to fend off the alien infection that's taken hold over their suburban town. John Hughes meets John Carpenter in this squirming, splattery, raucous homage to 80s horror. Grab your samurai swords and your TV remotes. It's going to be a long night. And this book is just a lot of fun because who among us doesn't remember grabbing some movies from the video store, making up a big bucket of popcorn, and having video nights of our own? And we've always sort of wondered, while we're watching our horror movies, what we would do if we were in a horror movie. And that's kind of what this book is about. The next of Adam Caesar's books is The Con Season. Let me read the back of this one. Horror movie starlet Clarissa Lee is beautiful, internationally known, and completely broke. To cap off years of questionable financial and personal decisions, Clarissa accepts an invitation to participate in a fully immersive fan convention. She arrives at an off-season summer camp and finds what was supposed to be a quick buck has become a real-life slasher movie. Deep in the woods of Kentucky, with a supporting cast of B-level celebrities, Clarissa must fight to survive the deadly game that the con's organizers have rigged against her. A demented, funny, bloody, and strangely poignant horror novel from the acclaimed author of Tribesmen, Zero Lives Remaining, and Mercy House. This one's also a lot of fun. This one, roughly speaking, is what happens when slasher movie people end up in a real-life slasher movie scenario. And the most recent of the Adam Caesar books is this clown in a cornfield. Allow me to read the description of this one. Quinn Maybrook just wants to make it to graduation. She might not make it to mourning. When Quinn and her father move to a tiny town with a weird clown for a mascot, they're looking for a fresh start. But ever since the town's only factory shut down, Kettle Springs has been cracked in half. Most of the town believes that the kids are to blame. After all, the juniors and seniors at Kettle Springs High are the ones who threw the party where Arthur Hill's daughter died. They're the ones who set the abandoned factory on fire and who spend all their time posting pranks on YouTube. They have no respect and no idea what it means to work hard. For the kids, it's the other way around. And now Kettle Springs is caught in a constant battle between old and new, tradition and progress. It's a fight that looks like it will destroy the town. 
until one homicidal clown with a pork pie hat and a red nose decides to end it for good. Because if your opponents all die, you win the debate by default. So this is actually marketed as a young adult novel, but don't let that dissuade you. I'm not the kind of guy who regularly reads young adult novels, and I'm here to tell you that this is good for adults as well. Like the other Adam Caesar books, this is very much a horror fans kind of horror novel. This takes a lot of the tropes of the slasher genre and breathes some new life into them, and it's a really good read. And so there we have three books by Adam Caesar. These are all a lot of fun. These are books by a horror fan for horror fans. So if you like old horror movies, including sometimes the cheesy ones, these are definitely going to be right up your alley. The next author on our list is Brian Knight, who was actually one of the first people to sort of welcome me into the horror community when I first started getting into horror many, many years ago. Longer ago than I care to admit. In any case, his books are also very good, and I don't think any of you will be disappointed if you want to pick one up. Again, I have chosen three that I'm going to highlight. The first of those is actually the first of his books that I read, and that is Feral. Allow me to read the description. Brian Knight's single author collection Dragonfly announced the arrival of a bold new voice in dark fantasy fiction. Now, in his first novel, Feral, he reveals more of his dark vision in the story of innocence lost and terror found. Shannon Pitcher was trying to forget the heartache of the past few months, the brutal murder of her ex-husband and the loss of her only daughter, when fate brought her to a lost and scared little girl named Charity at the gate of an abandoned and haunted place called Feral Park. Now she must save Charity from the same boogeyman who killed her own daughter and from the wild children of Feral Park. Gordon Chambers has searched for six years for his daughter. Even when his estranged wife is found slaughtered and his daughter Charity disappears, hope remains in the form of strange dreams. Gordon follows a trail of blood that leads him across the country to the small city of Riverside, Washington and Shannon Pitcher. After years of living as prisoner of the fairy tale monster that killed her mother, Charity has escaped. But the boogeyman wants her back and he will not stop until he has her. There is only one safe place for her now, but the price of safety will be more than her innocence. It will be her soul. The key to her escape may be the very thing that makes her so special to the supernatural killer. Feral is a tale of love, loss, and childhood fears come back to life. An excellent book that perfectly captures the fear I think most of us have of children encountering the kinds of monstrous figures that children ought not to encounter. And next up of the Brian Knight books is Hacks. The description on the back says, When novelist Jim Eldridge receives an invitation to a writer's retreat on Washington State's Mount Misery, it seems like the perfect escape from the last days of his dead marriage. Jim accepts the invitation to the Hacks Club and joins the other guests, including the legendary H. Casper and bestseller Heather Woods, for a week of fun and relaxation. Someone in those woods is not happy to see them. The body count rises, and the survivors band together to fight the relentless killer. Will they escape the nightmare on the Devil's Tail Ridge, or die trying? So this is a book about a bunch of writers at a writer's retreat out in the middle of nowhere, and there's a psycho killer on the loose. Fairly standard slasher fare in terms of premise, but executed brilliantly. And on a personal note, I actually make a very brief appearance in this book, as a acting sheriff character is named for me. And finally, the description of Farrell mentioned Brian's single author collection, Dragonfly, and that is my last recommendation. Now, this one that I have is the limited edition Leatherbound. There are only 26 of these, so you're not going to find this particular edition, because I don't think any of us are selling them. But you can find other editions of Dragonfly out there on the market. Now, as I mentioned, this is a collection of short stories, and these stories are excellent. There's a sort of theme running through a lot of Brian's work that has to do with missing children, lost children, children in danger, horrible things happening to children, and the horrors of that idea. And he renders it brilliantly, both in Feral and in these stories, and the collection is highly recommended. And next on our list is Ray Garden, who has written not only a bunch of horror novels, but also some tie-in novels and novelizations of some of the major franchises in media. Now, Ray Garten has been fairly prolific, but I've picked just a few books to highlight 
The first of those is this book, Live Girls. According to the description on the back, on the hardcore street that never sleeps, Davy Owen is lured into the nightmare of the damned. He's lost his girl, blown his job, and he's looking for consolation in the seedy precincts of Times Square. As dusk falls, a garish glow envelops the street where live girls beckons Davy through its doors, into a world of strange, savage ecstasy, into the pale, irresistible arms of a woman who offers him the kiss of demons in exchange for eternal life. A woman so ravishing, so insatiable, that he must say yes again and again until he can no longer say no. He has given her the vital essence of his body. Now she will devour his soul. So among horror people, there's something of a debate. There are people who think that vampires should be monstrous. And there are people who think vampires should be sexy and romantic. This is a book that kind of speaks to both audiences because these are monstrous vampires but they're also very attractive, seductive kinds of vampires. This is not a vampire romance, this is vampire horror, but with a sort of sexy overtone to it, and it's an excellent book. And the next one is Seductions. The description on the back says, Your dream lover has come. Pray your dreams don't come true. They are flawlessly beautiful, savagely seductive. They have walked among us in a hundred fearsome places. They fill our sexual fantasies, feed on the hot rush of human desire, make each of us a lover and a victim. Only a handful of us know they exist. One man and one woman will stake their lives and their souls against them, and the ancient evil that makes of death a sin of unimaginable ecstasy. So a funny thing about this, when Ray signed my copy, he inscribed it, The Book That Disturbed Robert Block. So for those of you in the know, that might tell you a little something about how disturbing Ray's work can be. Now next up is a book that I've actually already mentioned on this channel, and that's Ray Garten's Shackled. This is a story about an evil cabal that kidnaps children and pushes them into, essentially, sex slavery. The description, which is a little bit hard to read in this light, says, They are out there, waiting in the shadows, even in the highest places. The predators who stalk the weakest, most vulnerable members of society. A burned-out tabloid reporter and a best-selling true crime writer are about to stumble upon a dark conspiracy, and a man who thought he believed in nothing discovers how high a price he will pay to save the innocent, the damned, the shackled. I included Shackled in a previous video of five of the most disturbing books of all time, and it still deserves that ranking. It's also a very good book and highly recommended. In addition to those three, I want to mention two other books that represent sort of different avenues in Ray Garten's career. One of those is this book, Resurrecting Ravana, which is a Buffy the Vampire Slayer tie-in novel. And as a Buffy fan, this is perfect for me. Again, a very good book. And I believe I also mentioned this when I was summing up my favorite reads of 2020, because I only recently read this one. But a very good book, perfect for Buffy fans. And then there's this one, In a Dark Place. Now, this lists Ed and Lorraine Warren as the authors, and it just says, with Ray Garten in small print down at the bottom. However, Ray actually wrote this book. Now, the Warrens are the paranormal investigators slash demonologists slash frauds who inspired the Conjuring franchise. This book is the source of the movie The Haunting in Connecticut. And I should point out that though this is marketed as a true story, Ray Garten, the author himself, has actually distanced himself from the book because he considers all of the players, the family involved in the story and the Warrens, to be essentially frauds. Being a Ray Garten book, of course it's well written, but as a true story it falls flat because Ray was just reporting what he was told by people who weren't telling the truth. I'm not necessarily recommending this book, but neither am I not recommending this book. I am just mentioning this book to give you a connection between Ray Garten and some of the movies with which you're probably familiar. And next up is the late, great Tom Piccirilli. Again, I have chosen three books to recommend, but once again, he wrote, over the course of his career, many, many wonderful books across horror, but also crime and some other genres. He was a very prolific and wide-ranging author. The first of the three that I've selected is my personal favorite, and that's A Choir of Ill Children. 
The description on the back says, A choir of ill children is the startling atmospheric story of Kingdom Come, a decaying swamp backwater that draws the lost, the ill-fated, and the damned. Since his mother's disappearance and his father's bizarre suicide, Thomas has cared for his three brothers, conjoined triplets who have three bodies but share a single brain. In addition to the guardianship of his siblings, Thomas has inherited the town's only industry, the mill. Torn by responsibility and rage, Thomas must face his tormented past as well as the mysterious forces surging toward people he both loves and despises. This book is an example of the southern gothic genre, and I think it's one of the best examples of that genre that I've ever read. You really owe it to yourself to read A Choir of Ill Children. Next up is a book called A Lower Deep. The description on the back says, A man known only as the Necromancer and his demonic familiar named Self wander the spectral highways of the countryside, incurring the wrath of both heaven and hell, and facing the curses of the damned. But it's a figure from his past that may drive the Necromancer into a hell even he cannot escape. Jebediah DeLanker, the leader of the Necromancer's old coven, has created a new coven, an evil band determined to use the black arts for their own hideous ends. The Necromancer is forced to return to his home, a place haunted by memories where years earlier his original coven was destroyed, and where Danielle, the only love of his life, met an awful death. Together with Self, the Necromancer must battle not only his former master, but the members of the new coven and the jealous ghosts of his old one, all while taunted by the possibility that Danielle may return from the dead. It's worth pointing out that Tom Piccarelli actually wrote several books about this character, Self, and this is my favorite of those, but it's not the only one. So you might want to check out all of the Self stories. And last up is not exactly a horror novel, but not exactly not a horror novel. It's a very dark sort of crime novel, and that is The Dead Letters. The description on the back says, Five years ago, Eddie Witt's daughter Sarah became the victim of a serial killer known as Killjoy, and Witt vowed to hunt him down no matter what the cost. But the police have given up, and Killjoy has stopped killing, and in some bizarre act of repentance, has begun kidnapping abused infants and leaving them with the parents of his original victims. The only clues to Killjoy's identity lie in a trail of taunting letters, and even as they lead Wit to a deadly cult and closer to his prey, he begins to suspect that, like his wife, he's losing his grip on reality. Sarah's dollhouse is filled with eerie activity as if her murder never occurred. As dark forces rise around him, Wit must choose between believing that evil can repent and stepping into a trap set by a killer who may know the only way to save Wit's soul. So those are three wonderful, excellent books by Tom Piccarelli. I recommend any and all of the three, and in fact, any and all of his other works as well. And last for today, but certainly not least, is Michael McBride, who I also mentioned when I was summing up my favorite books that I read in 2020. And once again, I have chosen three books kind of four books, which I'll get to in a minute, to recommend. Up first is Chronicles of the Apocalypse Species, which I mentioned three and kind of four books because this is actually two books. The first book is called Species, and the second book is called The Hive, and this is an edition that collects both the first and second books in that world. The description reads, The end came on a Friday night. In the final days, humanity faced the final hour of existence. With a whimper, they passed from this life and into something inhuman, something monstrous, something alien. In the last hours, they longed for a deliverance that would never come. There was only emptiness. But all species are difficult to extinguish, and in humankind there were seven imperfect souls selected for survival. But what seemed a blessing was a nightmare, and the dead are unforgiving. This is an excellent book, kind of a sci-fi horror. One of the things about Michael McBride's work is that he is excellent at combining real science with a little bit of fictional science and a lot of fictional horror and somehow mixing them all together into a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. Speaking of sci-fi horror, the next one I'm going to recommend is Subhuman. This is actually the first in a series. It says a Unit 51 novel. 
There are now three books in that series, and I'm currently working my way through the sequels, but I'm just showing off the first one as a sort of stand-in for the entire series. The description on the back says, They are not human. At a research station in Antarctica, five of the world's top scientists have been brought together to solve one of the greatest mysteries in human history. Their subject, however, is anything but human. They are not natural. Deep beneath the ice, the submerged ruins of a lost civilization hold the key to the strange mutations that each scientist has encountered across the globe. A misshapen skull in Russia, the grotesque carvings of a lost race in Peru, the mummified remains of a humanoid monstrosity in Egypt. They are not friendly. When a series of sound waves trigger the ancient organisms, a new kind of evolution begins. Latching onto a human host, crossbreeding with human DNA, a long extinct life form is reborn. Its kind has not walked the earth for thousands of years. Its instincts are fiercer, more savage than any predator alive, and its prey are the scientists who unleashed it, the humans who spawned it, and the tender living flesh on which it feeds. So this is grade A creature feature stuff, but with a lot of really good science fiction woven in along with it. Now the last one is actually not a horror novel, but it's clearly written by a horror author, and that is The Extinction Agenda. The cover says the author was Michael Lawrence. It actually is the same person, just writing under a pen name to separate his horror from his thrillers. This is likewise the first in a series about a group called The Thirteen. This is a sort of political espionage thriller, and it's one of my favorite examples of that genre. I liked this one a lot, and I actually liked the second book in the series a little bit better, but I'm mentioning the first one because it's the first one. So if you're interested to see what a horror author does with a political thriller in terms of building suspense and maintaining tension, this is an excellent series to get your hands on. So there you have it. Several excellent books by five excellent authors. Of course, these are not the only five authors that I could have recommended, but I think it's a pretty good start. So I wish you happy reading, and until next time, take care and stay scared.